Hi, this is Blaine DeSantis, and welcome to a special edition of America's Game. Take me out to the ball game. Take me out with the crowd. Buy me some peanuts and cracker jack. I don't care if I never get back. Let me root, root, root for the home team. If they don't win, it's a shame. For it's one, two, three strikes, you're out at the old ball game. Welcome, everyone. It is Memorial Day weekend, and I thought that in honor of this day, I would take a little bit of a break from our usual talking about old-time ballplayers and instead take a look at a couple of the old-time legendary baseball games. Wow, this is really something. I think you're going to really enjoy this little bit of a twist this week. Some names you might not have heard of in the past we're going to hear about today. So I'm looking forward to chatting about this with you and having a good time. You know, what makes an interesting game? Well, back in the 1800s, it's hard to find this because these games were not covered regularly. They didn't have sports pages back then. You know, there were only limited outlets for uh, reports on baseball games. And so you have scattered box scores, and you really have to comb a lot of local newspapers to try to find such games. Not only that, would it be legendary because something happened for the first time? Or maybe it's legendary because there was an outstanding performance. Putting together what was a great game is a very difficult task. But I think today we're going to go over two games that I think you're going to really enjoy and we'll show why they are really two of the great games of the 1800s. And for our first game, I take us to July 21, 1886. That's right, 1886. And this is a game played in Trenton, New Jersey. And what's important about this? Well, this is the first interracial game among professional teams that was won by a colored or black team. That's right. The first time a colored team had defeated a professional team. Never happened before. Now, again, I use the word colored. I don't mean any offense, but I use this because that's what they were called back in the 1800s. You had colored leagues. You had colored players. Now we have Negro leagues, black players, African-American players, but I'm using verbiage that was used back then, okay? But this is the very first time, and let, fascinating, this game was played between the Cincinnati Red Stockings of the American Association and the Cuban Giants, which were an independent team. Now, Cincinnati, if you remember, if you remember Bid McPhee, remember we talked about Bid a few weeks ago, Cincinnati was not in the National League. They were in the American Association, which was a step down from the National League. Nonetheless, nonetheless, it was a professional league. It was a legitimate professional league. It had some really good players in it. Well, this game was played at Trenton, and it was the home field of the Cuban Giants. And the Cuban Giants were independent. That's why I said they were an independent team. There was no real Negro League back then. There may have been some uh, loose-knit leagues that played, but on the whole, these teams were uh, playing exhibition games for a couple reasons. Number one, to prove their ability to play the game, to play America's game. And second of all, to get financing. That's right. All these players needed to be paid and they needed to have expenses taken care of. So these professional games uh, played by the independent teams were very important for them. And, you know, it's interesting because the team never was based in Cuba, but they were called the Cuban Giants. Now, why was that? Well, it's because some places they had to pass themselves off as being dark-skinned Cubans. And therefore, that's the name, the Cuban Giants. Part of it. They'll be a little more later on, but that's part of the reason. Not only that, when the players went on the field, they used to speak gibberish to each other. Now, that could have been carny. It could have been any sort of language, okay? But it was being passed off as speaking Spanish. And most people back in the 18. Hundreds, let's face it, were not bilingual, okay? So yeah, they could speak gibberish, and people would think they were speaking Spanish. 
Well, the, the Cuban giants were founded by a gentleman by the name of Frank Thompson, who was the head waiter of the Argyle Hotel in Babylon, Long Island, New York. That's right. Now, that, again, is important. Oh, boy, a lot of important stuff here. Because they were independent, they could play anybody they wanted to. And so the Cuban Giants, they played colleges. They would play against minor league. They would play town teams, amateur or semi-pro. Okay, And they were a great draw. And eventually, as time went on, the teams in the American Association or even the American League liked to have exhibitions played with the Cuban Giants and some other touring teams because they were big financial draws. And so there was that degree of uh, acceptance. Oh, we'll, we'll be glad to have you as long as we get money from this whole thing. Well, the Cuban Giants were a year-round professional team. Oh, yeah. Even though, even though Fred Thompson was a, or Frank Thompson, Frank Thompson, I should say, was the head waiter at the Argyle Hotel, these guys played professionally the whole year round. They played baseball up north in the summer. Then in the fall, they came down south for a tour, and they ended up in Florida. Now, in Florida, there was actually, and I, don't, I don't know if you've ever heard of this, there was a Florida Hotel League. That's right. Florida Hotel League was set up. And this featured a lot of these black players who worked at the different hotels. Again, a place for them to play the game. And then the Cuban Giants, every year for a few years, went down to Havana to play a few games. Ah, there's the other reason they were called the Cuban Giants, because they did go down to Havana. They might not have been based out of there. They might not have had one Cuban on the team. But they used that, again, along with the, the dark-skinned Cuban and the speaking gibberish to gain acceptance. Okay? Very interesting stuff. So now they are going to play Cincinnati. Now the Red Stockings, as I said, they were in the American Association. And they were middling. Okay? They were not that good that year. Uh, at the time they were uh, playing this game, they were in the middle of what was considered a long road trip that took them to Philadelphia and to Baltimore. And the team at the time of the game had a record of 38 wins and 40 losses. And guess who was playing second base without a glove? That's right, our buddy Bid McPhee, who, by the way, went hitless in this game. That's right. Remember, Bid was always a glove man. <laughs> without a glove. But, <laughs> but he, he was not known for his bat. He certainly didn't show any prowess at it in this game either. But uh, the team of the the Giants, the Cuban Giants, were not just a, any old team. These were some of the top colored players of the day. And this, is, this has been decreed by none other than a gentleman by the name of Saul White, who wrote a great book about colored baseball. Now, I'm saying this, and I know I know my pr director, producer, and uh, chief cook and bottle washer, Nathaniel, is working on this. We're going to try to get some photos of these players for you, okay? We're going to try to do that. We might not be able to get captions as to who is who, but we have got some players that, that I think you could, might enjoy seeing their photos. Who are these people? Try to put some sort of a name with a face or something so we have an idea of who we're looking at here, okay? So we're going to be working on that, okay? So now, as I said, this was some of the greatest colored baseball players of the day, beginning with a gentleman by the name of Clarence Williams, who was their catcher. And after him, they had Jack Fry, who was their second baseman. Abe Harrison played shortstop. I think maybe the best of them may have been Benjamin Boyd out in center field. They had Arthur Thomas playing first base, and their pitcher was Shep Trusty, which is one of the great names. Shep Trusty, I love that name, okay? So those were some of the top players on the Cuban Giants. Now, who was playing for uh, the Cincinnati team. Were they a stock team? No, they were not stacked or stocked, whatever. They were not loaded. They had, of course, they had big the second base. Their best pitcher was a gentleman by the name of Tommy, or excuse me, Tony Mullane. 
He was the their top pitcher. I think that year he even won 30 some ball games. But for this game, no, he wasn't pitching this game. No, he was playing the outfield this time. Again, remember, it's an exhibition game, so they're not about to use their best pitcher on an exhibition on an exhibition game, even if it's against a very good Cuban Giants baseball team. All right. We had outfielder had uh, Pop Corkhill, another great name, Pop Corkhill. Charlie Jones was in the outfield, and Hick Carpenter was at third base. Again, remember I talked about nicknames, you know, Bid, Pop, Hick. You can't beat these names. Yeah, Shep up there. I mean, it's just good stuff. I love nicknames. Well, who was the pitcher? If if we weren't going to have Tony, Tony Mullane, I can't say the gentleman's name, Tony Mullane, who was the pitcher? Well, the Cincinnati pitcher was none other than Charles Hazan Morton. And who was he? He was the manager. That's right. The manager pitched. It was the only game he pitched the entire season, which again shows you how the whole exhibition game was thought of. Okay. And again, a bit of cockiness by the Cincinnati team. They thought they could throw their manager and that, you know, he had been a, a, a pitcher years before. They thought he could throw the manager and get away with it. As they say, eh, that dog don't fly. No. Well, now how did this game begin? Remember I said it played up in Trenton, which was the uh, home ballpark of the Cuban Giants. Well, despite that being their home ballpark, the Cuban Giants were actually the visiting team. Don't quite understand that, but they were the visiting team. And so they came up the bat first. And right off the bat, bingo, bango, bongo, they score in the first inning to take a one to nothing lead. Things are you know, a little restless and nothing happens. That's the thing. The Reds are not scoring. And then in the fifth, the Cuban Giants add five more. Oh, my word. What's going on here? A route's taking place. Cincinnati eventually, eventually draws to within six to four, but could get no more. And the last few innings, uh, the Cuban Giants add a few more runs and... The final score, the Cuban Giants 9, the Cincinnati Red Stockings 4. Now, this was a shock to everyone. Again, it shouldn't have come as a shock. But again, we didn't have a lot of knowledge of the colored baseball back then. They didn't get regular newspaper coverage. They didn't get the, the, the general follower of baseball wasn't following that league. No, they were following the National League or they were following the American Association. So this was a real jolt. As a matter of fact, the one Cincinnati paper for a long period of time refused to believe the game was even played. Well, why would that be? Because no one sent back a report about the game. Wow, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> the Cincinnati paper wouldn't even publish a report because they didn't get one. But one report was put out, and the, yes, we do know that the Cuban Giants defeated the Cincinnati Red Stockings. You know, that began an era of the, the Cuban team playing a bunch of minor league and major league teams in exhibition play. And again, they had a pretty doggone good record. And again, go one step further. Take a look at who pitched and who played for the, for the professional teams, like for the National League or the American Association. They never put their top guy out there for long, the longest time. That's right. So the 18, late 1800s, we saw the beginning of interracial play. And you know what? From what I read, there had been no incidents. There was no anger. There was no hostility. Yeah, the game was played like the game was meant to be played. And it was just a good time, a tough time. And in the end, the Cuban Giants win. And so that marks a truly red-letter day in baseball history. That's right, July 21, 1886. The black team, the colored team, the Cuban Giants, defeat the Cincinnati Red Stockings by a score of 9-4. to four. Before I get to the next game... Time to take what I will call a seventh inning stretch. You know, I want to say thank you to all of the people out there who love baseball research as much as I do. I know I got a lot of fans out here who are listening 
a lot of baseball fans who listen and really have enjoyed learning about the old timers. And it's fun hearing about the, the names and the, the statistics and everything and how the game was different and uh, just how the game was played and, and how it was viewed back then. And it's been so much fun. But you know what? There are a group of people out there who do this for a living. I mean, they sit there and scour, scour. Yeah box scores from all over the the country trying to find information about these early games. I want to say a particular note of thanks and a shout out to a good guy that I met up at the hall one time. I have his book. His name is John Thorne. And John is the official historian of Major League Baseball. Really good guy and uh, has written a Very good book about the beginnings of the game. You see his name a lot of time in introductions to baseball books, and he's a real good guy. Shout out to John. Also, a shout out to the late Saul White. You know, I mentioned him earlier. Now, Saul White was an early player, manager, and pioneer in the of the colored leagues. And he wrote the book. Literally, he wrote the book on this. He is called The History of Colored Baseball. And he goes down and gives you the history and gives you the players. And this was written in the early part of the 1900s. So, you know, it was pretty fresh in his mind when he was writing this. And so here we are over 100 years later learning a lot of this stuff that that Saul White knew firsthand. And it's really, really great to read what this gentleman wrote about the game and about the players he knew so well. I also want to give a shout out to a gentleman by the name of Bill Felber who has put together some great Sabre books and articles on these older games. Great stuff. I look at them. I refer to them a lot of the times, and it's just really good work that he has done. And and along with the the nameless people who are part of the Sabre 19th Century Committee, you know, we talk about Sabre as if it's all analytics. And I've been able to meet some really super nice folks out there with Sabre who are not really on the analytics side, they're on the research side. And it is lots of fun to meet with them, to talk with them, to talk baseball, to talk old-time baseball. And the fact is, they are very welcoming. I mean, they were so welcoming to Magda and myself. Make us First time we met them, they brought us into the fold and everything else. Told about all the different uh, events there are for Sabre members uh, who like the research. And so, hey, a shout out to all of you researchers at Sabre. I really appreciate all your work and all your friendship. Now for our second and final game. I'm going to take us to February 9, 1889. And that is a game that's played by the All-Americas. That's right, the All-Americas versus the Chicago White Stockings. Where was this game played? Ah, that's what makes this game special. This game was played at the Great Pyramid in Giza, Egypt. That's correct. The game was played in the shadows of the Great Pyramid in Giza. Can you believe this? Yeah. This is the only game ever played at a 3,000-year-old ballpark. This was amazing. This the, the stories behind these are just great. This is part of Albert Spaulding's postseason baseball tour of the world. He decided he was going to go on a trip to try to promote America's game, our national pastime to the world. And so he selected two teams, 10 players on a team. Can you imagine only 10 players on a team? My God. They started out in America, and then they went to Hawaii, Australia, New Zealand, India, Italy, France, Scotland, England, and of course, they got to Egypt. And like I said, they were there to promote our national pastime as a game that has made it. It should be looked upon as an international game. And, you know, here we are in 2021. I think it's 2021. I may have missed all of 2020 with the coronavirus, but I think it's 2021. And you see Korean baseball, Japanese baseball. I know uh, they play in baseball down under. 
in the Australians, New Zealand's playing baseball. It's in the Olympics. There's baseball coming all over Central America, South America. People are playing ball everywhere. It has truly become an international game. And a lot of that begins with Al Spalding and his trip around the world. Now, this tour was a financial bust, okay? It didn't make any money because most of the fans were American tourists. Despite wanting to spread the game, uh, it was mostly Americans who were there. The thing is, it was a financial bust, but they filled the stadiums. It's just that the stadiums weren't that big at the time, maybe 3,000 people. And so there weren't that many monies there to be split among the players and help defray expenses. But this tour began in October, shortly after the World Series, and they returned to the United States in March. That's right, October to March in time for spring training. Now, what Spalding did was he selected 10 players from his Chicago White Stockings team, and he took 10 players from the other National League teams in total, okay? We had a total of five future Hall of Famers were on the tour, and there was actually a sixth player who was in the Hall of Fame who played only on the American games in the tour. Fascinating, another Hall of Famer, another future Hall of Fame. Hall of Famer was not on the Chicago team, and that was Hugh Duffy. Hugh Duffy was not on the team. He's in the Hall of Fame. We'll probably talk about him sometime in the future, in a future episode. But uh, Hugh was not there, and probably because I think he was making it clear, Hugh was jumping to the Players League after this. Yeah, so they didn't want him on the team. Anyway, who was these Hall of Famers? Well, here we go with our names again. We had, of course, probably maybe the greatest player of the 1800s, Cap Anson. You had John Montgomery Ward, Ned Hanlon, George Wright, who was the umpire, who's a famous manager and early ball player, and Henry Chadwick, the baseball sports writer. Now, these guys were there, and they toured the world. And you want know, to think about it. It's the 1880s. These, most of these players came from farms. These were not sophisticated players. And yet they got to go around the world. We have pictures of them in the Coliseum. They couldn't play there. It was a disaster. What a shock. But they had, they had pictures of them in the Coliseum. They had pictures of around the world. Oh, you can find some of these things up at the Hall of Fame in Cooperstown. Oh, yeah. It's a wonderful tour. It was ambitious. And uh, yet it was fun for these players. They stayed a little bit in shape. They had a good time spreading the word. And... Uh, they showed their lack of sophistication by trying to throw stones at the Sphinx prior to the game. That's right. They're going to throw the great Sphinx of Egypt. They're going to throw stones at the Sphinx. And one player actually hit the, the, the right eye of the Sphinx with a stone. That's right. They hit the one, one of the wonders of the world with a stone in the right eye. Ay, ay, ay. Ay. Well, there are no daily reports of the games that were on the tour. And, and, uh, that they sort of got weekly reports on something called a magazine called Sporting Life. There would be some reports that were being sent into that magazine. And if you were lucky enough to get that, you could sort of keep up with what was going on. But, you know, we didn't get box scores. We didn't get any reports on each and all the games. And to be honest with you, no one knows the score of this game too much. Nope. No, no, but it was uh, most of the, these things. We are not sure of the official score. We know at the time that they got to Cairo, the All-Americans led 15 wins. Chicago had 13 and there was one tie. So now we're in Cairo and we've got to get out to the, <laughs> got to get out to the pyramids, which, you know, there's no road there. So how do the teams get there? Well, here we go. The Amer All-Americans, they rode camels. And the Chicago team rode donkeys. And halfway to the, uh, the the pyramid, they switched. So they each got the chance to experience riding a donkey or a camel. Like I said, this was a great thing for these players. They never saw things like this. It was a, it was a truly amazing tour these guys were on. And by the time they got there, the field had been marked out on the hot desert sands. And uh, they played a game. Now, we don't know the box score, as I said. Uh, we're told that the game was finally called with the All-Americans winning by a score of 10 to 6. 
We don't know if that was really the score. We don't know how long they played. Good Lord knows if you hit the ball in the sand, it could roll forever because there were no bleachers. That's right. People were standing there, sitting there on their camels with their donkeys. It was a very unique crowd to spectators, to put it mildly. But it is a legitimate game. They had the game at the, at the pyramid in Egypt. And I'm going to tell you what. Uh, it was something that truly had to be uh, uh, witnessed by some of these people. You can't believe it until you see it. And those people did. And that was great, a great thing. And again, it sort of showed that America was becoming an international sport with our national pastime baseball. Who knows how old or who knows where the doggone thing was founded. But by the eight, late 1800s, they were going around the world. And it wasn't the first tour by Spalding. He did other tours too, so this was not the first. And so, yet, it was the first one to ever have their game played at the pyramids of Giza, Egypt. I hope you have enjoyed learning about two of the well, great games of the 19th century. I think so. I've had a good time researching them and talking to you about them. These were important games. These were important people. You might not have heard all the names before, but now you've heard a few of them. Maybe you want to go out and do a little bit of research. You know, there are some books out there you might be interested in. Brett Jones, I know you're listening. Brett Jones, you might want to buy one of these books one of these days and, and check into some of these old-time ballplayers because it's, it's great fun, folks. It's great fun to learn about the game, to learn about the way it was played and how much fun the game had and how much fun they had. I'll tell you what, I've had a ball and I want to thank you for joining me. And I want to also wish you again a happy Memorial Day, a very happy Memorial Day. May you spend it uh, relaxing. If you can't relax, hamburger, hot dogs, a soft drink, a beer, who cares? Whatever you want to do, hey, why don't you sit down and make sure you listen to this podcast of America's Game because I think you're going to really enjoy it. Anyway, next week we're going to be back with our regular look at some of the old-time players, and we're going to be discussing one of the sport's first celebrity baseball players. That's coming up next Saturday. So until then, for America's Game, this is Blaine DeSantis saying, I'll see you at the ballpark. Take me out to the ball game. Take me out with the crowd. Buy me some peanuts and cracker jack. I don't care if I never get back. Let me root, root, root for the home team. If they don't win, it's a shame. For it's one, two, three strikes, you're out at the old ball.